Welcome, everyone, and I'll please continue to come in, and there are seats, there are seats right down here in the front row for anyone who wants to be asked a question. I want to um, thank the many people who actually helped me uh, prepare this address. I wanted to, um, in my first State of the Medical Center address, make sure I touched on things that were important to everyone working here. And so I, uh, a lot of people were very indulgent with their time as I tried to pry out of them the things they'd really like to hear in the State of the Medical Center address. And so I, I just want to thank all of you for helping me prepare. I also, um, you'll note that this is a little bit of a change in that we usually have this address in January, after the first of the year. But I thought, giving, uh, given I'm new in this role and we have a, a very new leadership team, uh, a lot of questions about what, w what our priorities are and wh where we're headed. And also, it's been a rather extraordinary year. I think we'd all agree that the things that have happened both within Vanderbilt and outside Vanderbilt in the economy and the world around us are fairly unprecedented. So I thought it would be good to have a State of the Medical Center address right at the beginning of the year as people are coming back from vacation, as the new students are arriving, so that we can frame set and think about how we'll tackle the year together. The first, uh, the first slide I want to show is my family. And uh, <coughs> one of the reasons I want to show this slide is it took about 50 shots to get both the dogs looking in the same direction. <laughs> and so we're really proud of that. That's Otto and Emmy. Um, I want to say, I wanted to show this slide and Melinda and I wanted to say thank you. Um, it's been a fairly extraordinary year for my family. We've as some of you know, um, my father and my stepmother both passed away this year. I became dean. I became vice chancellor. My oldest son went away to college about two weeks ago. I think on that life stress indicator, <laughs> I'm somewhere in there. And, and it's really been the support and encouragement and real affection from everyone here that's made all the difference and has really made this uh, in spite of all the challenges, a great year. And I just wanted to thank you, and Melinda wanted to thank you all for that. The other reason I wanted to show my family is I wanted to talk a little bit about family. You know, um, one of the reasons that this is the best job in the country is that this enterprise functions like a family. And when we at Vanderbilt think about our colleagues and how we treat our colleagues and how we treat our patients and how we treat our students, we do that the way we treat our own families. And I actually think that's very special and very unique about this place. It's the reason I came back after being a student here. And, and it's so different than almost any place else you'd work. Um, I'm going to come back to this because I don't see this as kind of a side issue or an anecdote. I actually see it as something that's very core that will drive everything we'll do in the future. And the other reason I wanted to show family is because of, like my family, um, we're a very diverse family. And, you know, so my son is interested in literature and my daughter's interested in, um, well, she's interested in all kinds of things, but she's, she's interested in art. And, and this one's uh, Maddie, uh, Jillian's interested in art. Maddie's mostly interested in soccer. We as an enterprise are interested in very different things. It's one of the great challenges and opportunities of an academic medical center is that we have people interested in science and discovery. We have people interested in education. We have people primarily interested in caring for patients. And while all of those things individually are extraordinary, they're also extraordinary in the way they come together. And so a lot of what I want to say to you today is acknowledging those extraordinary accomplishments within the domains of interest that exist here, but also talking a little bit about how when we work together and bring those interests together, the sum is greater than the parts. So <clears throat> we have become a player. Um, there's no question about it. When I came back in 1998, Vanderbilt was wandering around 30th most of the rankings, uh, the medical center that is, and, and that means a number of things, but uh, one of the things it means is that it's within our reach to really be a dominant player in academic medicine, in science, nationally and worldwide. 
that wasn't possible in 1998. Because of what's happened here over the last decade, it is now possible. And, you know, we were 16th last year. The School of Medicine is 15th this year. We're just marching up higher and higher. And now we need to begin to think about what does it mean to be one of the most influential places in healthcare and discovery in the country? And what does that look like for Vanderbilt, and how will we engage in that and make that happen? I also want to mention that the School of Nursing has climbed very high in its prestige nationally. And I want to pay special uh, tribute to Dean Conway Welsh, who didn't know I was going to do this. But she is celebrating her 25th year as Dean of the School of Nursing. And I just want to say, first of all, she's the second longest running Dean in the United States, which is a huge accomplishment because, you know, that deans, they kind of kick us out after a few years. And she's, she's really hung on. And the reason she has is because she has done and continued to do extraordinary things with our nursing school. If you look at the history of the nursing school, it's 100 years old. 70% of the nurses that have graduated from Vanderbilt, she graduated. And that's because of the growth in our nursing graduate education programs over the last 25 years. So Colleen, I just wanted to give you a shout out and recognize what you've done. Our hospitals are, are clearly top 20. And the number every year of programs that U.S. News lists increases. I want to pay special mention to these programs up here at the very top. These are part of the Bill Wilkerson Center for Hearing and Speech. And Bill Wilkerson is the best in the country. We just celebrated Fred, Bre Fred Bess's retirement the other night. We unveiled his portrait. And it's really something to be number one. And I actually think that where we really ought to be headed is all of these programs become like these. We are where we become the destination medical center for not just Bill Wilkerson hearing and speech, but everything we do. And I actually believe that's possible because of a lot of things, because of the culture here, because of what we built here, but because of some special opportunities we have as a medical center because of our special as assets and the way we're configured. I want to make special mention of the Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital just to show that this is possible. Isn't it extraordinary that after five and a half years, they celebrate their, the hospital's birthday in February of this coming year. They'll be six years old. They're already seen as a top 20 children's hospital in just about any ranking you can look at. I don't think a children's hospital has made that kind of progress in history ever anywhere. So that just shows you what's possible when people are committed and they're executing on a plan and they have vision. <clears throat> now, there's no question that one of the big reasons Vanderbilt has moved ahead and this medical center is becoming recognized as an academic health center for health relates closely to the progress we've made in discovery. People know that places discover can do special things when push comes to shove in healthcare. They know the care that they're going to get here is the most innovative. And, and frankly, on a numerical basis, we know that the U.S. News, ranking, news rankings for hospitals are more or at least 50% based on our NIH funding. So in that, in that way, our discovery enterprise and our healthcare enterprise are greatly interwoven in their success. This, this is an amazing growth curve. This is the growth in our research dollars on an annual basis starting in 1999. And you can see that even though the NIH budget, the federal NIH budget climbed to about 30 billion and then stopped growing, um, Vanderbilt didn't notice. We just kept growing. And now we are one of the nine or ten largest biomedical research enterprises in this country. And that's very, very important in what it's possible for us to do over the next decade. We are a player. You'll notice that even this year, in the middle of the economic crisis, we grew. Just a little bit, but we did grow. And if you look at the growth curves of most of our 
peer competitors across the country, they fell in NIH funding and other kinds of research funding. So we really held our own in a difficult time. And as I'll show you with the uh, additional dollars coming in from the stimulus package, we anticipate quite a bit of growth, excuse me, growth over the next year. The, the other reason that our, our health care and, and our hospitals and clinics and our programs are becoming highly ranked is, in fact, the extraordinary care we provide. And I just wanted to mention um, this five days at Vanderbilt Medical Center. It actually happened a year ago when U.S. News and World Report actually came here and camped out here for a week. It doesn't happen very often, but they chose us because they'd heard that amazing things were happening at Vanderbilt. And, and it was a really interesting experience to have them here, and when they walked away, they met with us and they told us some things. One of the things they told us was that we've never seen a place that has its arms and its head so wrapped around informatics and the use of information and the ability to move that information into the healthcare setting right at the time people need it. We've just never seen anything like that anywhere. You guys have really got something going on here. They gave us a lot of encouragement around our efforts there. And as many of you know, we're building and building on those efforts. The other thing they said was something we all kind of know, but I'd never really seen it in print before. They said we had an un a remarkable culture. A culture that's been building here for over a hundred years, but a culture where we care about one another, and that comes through in how we care for patients and the people who come here. They said they noticed that without us telling them about it. And they said it over and over again through the article and then their comments to the people they were meeting with and to the leadership team. I, I found that very validating. I haven't forgotten it. And it's another reason that I think that this special atmosphere is something that's got to be key to our strategy moving forward. So, so our pillar goals, um, we, we have a program, as you know, called Elevate. And in Elevate, we have pillar goals that really help us keep our eye on the ball. And we will continue this program, albeit with some changes, because you all know I love change, so I have some changes planned. But I wanted to show this because one of the great things that happened under the Elevate program is a real focus on people and service. And um, one of the things the U.S. News team noted was how well we've done in those areas. So, so we are going to talk a little bit about what the enterprise has accomplished over the last year in all of these pillars, and then at the same time I'm going to filter in some of the new goals we have for next year in these pillars, and then there's another pillar that we're going to add that I want to tell you about. So people. You know, a, a very hard measure of how people feel about working at Vanderbilt is turnover, how many people stay. And um, at all major health systems, turnover is a significant um, issue. And Vanderbilt uh, Medical Center, all VUMC turnover has been really low this year. In fact, it's, it's been well below our reach goal. Now, um, some of that we have to admit is the economy. People, <laughs> people just are not, you know, really thinking about moving around right now, and, and we all understand that. Um, nursing turnover has been extraordinarily low. But I actually don't think it's just the economy because several other, other independent things have happened that have validated the quality of the working atmosphere here, that people actually like working here. One is that we were named to the Fortune 100 best places to work, the whole university. And there has never been a university named in this list. So to be the first university named, it's just, In fact, it was so unusual that it says companies. We're not a company. Um, they're going to have to change the name of the thing so that you know it makes sense to have us in there. So, so that was a that was a huge point of validation for the kind of atmosphere we're creating at Vanderbilt throughout the entire university and in the medical center. And then in separate domains, we've been getting external validation about the work environment. Scientist Magazine 
for the second time, they did this in 2005 and they did it again last November, told us that for places doing research all over the country, in surveys of the people in our research enterprise, we rank in the top 10 in job satisfaction. So people like working in the discovery enterprise at Vanderbilt. There are something like 26,000 people working at Vanderbilt. A quarter of those people are working in research. So that's a lot of, a lot of the enterprise right here. Now, in, in 2010, in fiscal year 10, what are we focused on? We're focused on all the things we were focused on before, but one of the things we want to get right is our community survey. And um, Marilyn will shoot me if I don't get this right. The survey opens today. That was the one thing I was, I was supposed to remember to say. And we have heard you, meaning we know the last survey was long and miserable. <laughs> so we have a new survey. We actually got rid of the company that did the old survey and we brought in a new company. And it's much, much more streamlined. You don't have to answer every question twice. And you can finish it in I think you can finish it in 15 minutes. I really think it's important that everybody at Vanderbilt do this survey. It really tells us what you think, and if you're one of the people that isn't filling it out, you're exactly the person we need to hear from. And I don't have very ambitious goals for this. I just expect that 99.9999% of the people. I realize there's somebody in a cave somewhere that's not going to do this, but I really want everybody to participate in the survey. Now in service, I want to talk about service in terms of the groups of people we serve. And we actually serve two groups of people. We're a university medical center, so we serve our patients and we serve our students. Those students could go anywhere and they, sh they choose to come here. We are actually doing an outstanding job with our students. This um, medical student survey that's not done by us, it's done by the AAMC, this 69% of, of medical students saying they're satisfied with the quality of their education is more than twice the rate of satisfaction on average in the country. This puts us in the top five academic medical centers in the country, believe it or not. So I guess that tells you two things. One, that we're performing well and that by and large medical students aren't thrilled with medical education. <laughs> um, but so, we, so we're happy about this, but we know we have some work to do because we want to set the standard. Our graduate students are extremely happy, and when I found, when I talked to Roger Chalkley about this, I actually found out that we're one of the few places that even bothers to ask. So we don't even have national data to compare to. Our nursing, sorry, our nursing, whoops, can you help me out a little bit there? I'm sorry I didn't. Uh, go back one slide, thanks. Our nursing students um, are also extremely happy with their education. They have a different scale that they rate on. And we also survey our residents as they're leaving and we have high satisfaction throughout the ranks of our residents. This is extremely important. These are our ambassadors. They carry the message all over the country and all over the world about what it's like to be at Vanderbilt. Having them feel great about the experience they've had here has to be one of our primary goals. The other, of course, is, is our patients and um, the satisfaction they have with their care here. Here we're also making progress, but we have challenges. <clears throat> if you look at fiscal year 09, the year we just completed in June 30th, rating the overall quality of care, um, uh, almost all of the areas are showing a ranking that's in the top tier. Now, um, again, sort of like the medical students, um, how is it that adult inpatient can be in the top 3.5% in the country and only 70% of the people surveyed say the care was excellent? I don't think the bar is set high enough. I think that if we can be in the top 3 percentile and only get it right 7 out of 10 times, we can't compare ourselves to other academic medical centers or other hospitals because the bar in healthcare is just set too low. And we really need to have goals where these numbers look like these numbers. The other area I want to mention is our outpatient areas. And here's uh, an area where we have a lot of room for improvement, but frankly, we're, we're victims of our own success. 
Because we're becoming so successful, the demand for our services in the outpatient arena has become staggering. And it's become more and more difficult for us to meet that demand. Everybody wants to see our doctors. And that's a great thing, but we don't have systems in place yet. We're working on them to make sure that we can see people quickly. This is a goal for next year. The target is that new patients will be seen in the Vanderbilt Health System within 15 days. There is nothing that makes someone feel like we don't care about them more than to call us and hear that it's going to be two months before they can see us. That has to go away completely. If we get nothing else fixed, I want this fixed. <laughs> and we will fix it. David Posh and Wright Pinson and the VMG team are hard at this. They have very exciting plans for reworking how we manage, uh, not only getting people in to see us in clinics, but then once they're here, how to manage them through that process so that their time is, is managed efficiently. So I'm very optimistic that we'll be successful here, and it is a big priority for next year. This is something I, I love to talk about because, you know, in the quality arena, we are just eating everyone's lunch. I, I, I don't know any other way to say it. What this means is that <clears throat> 0.71, 1.0 is average, the average hospital. So 0.71 is, is you're performing better than average by 29%. So in real terms, 100 people that would have been expected to die in the average hospital, if they came to Vanderbilt, only 71 would have died. What that means is that given the size and scale of our health system, last year, 378 people lived because they came here. You know, if there isn't anything else that we remember when we leave here today, I want everybody to remember that. Those are real lives. That's a lot of people. And it's because of your commitment and how much you care about everything you do that we've been able to hit these targets and make this happen. There are very few hospitals in the country and, in fact, the world that have observed to expected mort mortality statistics that look like this, maybe just a couple. And <clears throat> next year, the target, since we beat 0.71 and we hit 0.68, next year the target's 0.65. That will make us number one in the country. And what that will mean is 480 people who would have died if they'd gone to the average hospital will survive because they came to Vanderbilt. That's real impact. Now, there's a lot behind that. What makes that happen? And one of the big things that we know makes it happen is removing the variability and making sure we do the right thing and only the right thing for every patient. Practically no health system in this country is using evidence-based order sets. Evidence-based medicine is a nice concept, but people aren't actually implementing it. At Vanderbilt, we have well over 500 evidence-based order sets, and more than 50% of the patients cared for are being cared for on those order sets. There isn't another place in the country that's even close to us in this effort. We want to get up to close to 80%. We don't think beyond 80% makes sense because there are a lot of patients that have extraordinary circumstances that don't fit into an evidence-based order set very well. But we do think that this is one of the key strategies and key success stories actually driving these incredible mortality statistics. We, we really um, had an interesting week in August. Um, <clears throat> the Joint Commission came. You know when your relatives sort of show up? You weren't expecting them. It's Sunday afternoon. They kind of come by. Want to have dinner? We, we had that experience. They, they did show up. They came, and they stayed for a week. And they actually accredit us. So... Um, Several hundred people in this organization dropped everything they were doing and made sure that, um, that they saw 
not just the best of Vanderbilt Medical Center, but all of this University Medical Center in everything we do, in Williamson County, at Hundred Oaks, Children's Hospital, they were everywhere. It was, <coughs> shall we say, a thorough physical examination. And, um, and the, the results were quite extraordinary. Uh, these people are brought here to be critical of us. And, and they were critical, and they found some things that we need to improve on. One of the things they found was we have protocols that make a whole lot of sense that sometimes we don't follow, like hand washing. Uh, we need to do better with hand washing. We, need, we, we know what these areas are where it's attention to detail, and we just need to start to get those things right. But one of the things they said I, I want to tell you about, because it was one of those rare moments Orrin Ingram, who, um, as some of you know, is the chair of our Medical Center Affairs Committee of the Board of Trust, was at the exit interview with me. And at the end of the session, where they were telling us about all the things they wanted us to do better, one of the lead surveyors came up to, to Orrin and, and pulled him aside, and I was standing behind them, and she said, I just want you to know that I've been in this business 25 years and I have never seen a cancer center as good as this one. We had a very happy board chair that day. Um, that kind of thing just doesn't happen very often and people will tell you that we were hearing those kinds of comments all over the medical center they were really blown away by what we do here. And so the JCO survey was a huge success and I just want to thank everybody for the kind of effort that went into what happened that day and um, I know we're going to keep having that success. I also want to make, make a point that just like we have quality goals for the clinical enterprise, we also are focused heavily on quality in the research enterprise and these are papers that, um, these are the covers of very high profile journal, journals where our faculty have published this year. Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, Cell, Nature, idea of the impact these discoveries are having. We had 47,000 news placements from the medical center this year. Interviews news articles. Just to give you some sense, the prior year it was 29,000. So we had a 45 percent increase in the visibility of the science at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in one year. I, I know that that's an extraordinary achievement by our news and public affairs team in helping us get it out there, but it also speaks to the amazing work that's going on in this medical center and the reason people want to talk about us and want to interview us and want to see us um, on television, and um, I know we've all seen Bill Schaffner. It's not just Bill Schaffner on TV. <laughs> Everybody's on TV now. Um, this is just extraordinary, and so we're going to stay, just as we're focused on quality in the clinical enterprise, we're focused on quality in the research enterprise. <coughs> this is um, the finance piece. Um, we, um, we need to talk about finance because to really understand where we are as a medical center and how we're coping with the challenges out there, transparency is crucial. I want you to know and I want you to understand where we are, what we're managing, and how we're going to move forward. So you can see what ha where we were in fiscal year 08, and fiscal year 09 is the year that just ended June 30th. And you can see that the hospitals and clinics, the healthcare enterprise, is performing really, really well. We're hitting on all cylinders. Our beds are full. Our hospitals are brimming with, with patients. Our outpatient clinics are full. The, the engine is running better than it ever has. That is the most crucial thing for all of this, is that that's really working very, very well. Now, we have, in the face of a very difficult year, continued to invest, just like last year, close to $30 million in our academic mission. So the reason there are brackets around this is we actually take that money 
from what we generate in other areas and support uh, research because research doesn't completely support itself. And if you want to build the kind of discovery enterprise that we have, you have to support it. So before, sorry, before we, um, we talk about um, what happened in the economy, we were doing very, very well. This is what happened um, in fiscal year 09 that led to a result where at the end of the year we had less money than we started with. I don't know that that's ever happened. Um, maybe it happened sometime in the past with one of those deans whose picture's on the wall, but I, don't, I, I never actually met them. But, but the economy that we dealt with last year was also unprecedented. And, um, and so this is why we didn't have salary increases this year. This money that you generated in fiscal year 08 was all the money that went into buying new equipment, major capital things that had to be replaced, x-ray machines, all the different microscopes, anything that we needed during the year comes out of the margin we generate in the prior year. Well, there is no margin from fiscal year 09. So in order to get through the year, in fiscal year 10, and do the things we needed to do and keep all of our people here, which is also fairly extraordinary, you, you stepped up to the plate. And we didn't have salary increases. We didn't pay bonuses. And, and I actually think that, again, goes back to the family culture we have here. People said, loud and clear, it's more important to us that we keep everyone here working and moving forward than to have pay increases. If I didn't hear it once, I heard it a thousand times. And not every academic medical center and not every health system in this country made that decision. University of Chicago, Yale, Harvard, great, great places that we compete with head to head have done massive layoffs. We didn't experience that here because we pulled together as one team and made through this. So I just want to thank you for your sacrifices and your commitment to who we are and what we are that's helped us weather this storm. We're moving forward. The future looks very, very good. These are our goals for fiscal year 10. You can see inpatient discharges. We're expecting more inpatients because we're going to complete the third bed tower in November. All of those beds will open and we'll basically increase the volume of our inpatient business, which is going to help our revenues. The same thing's true with ambulatory visits. Look at this healthy increase. 100 Oaks, we'll have a full year of 100 Oaks being open. That's dramatically increasing our outpatient business, as is our growing, growing um, practices in Williamson County. <clears throat> so this is very, very healthy growth for the clinical enterprise, which is going to be very important in helping us meet our financial goals. Research awards will also increase. The NIH stimulus package, the $10 billion that was approved last year, that's all now starting to flow in our direction. Already in the first two months of this year, we've been notified of close to $25 million in grant awards from the stimulus package. We're getting more than our share, and that's a good thing. And the, and the last thing I list here is something that you've probably not seen on these, <coughs> on these slides before, and that's gifts. Philanthropy is a very, very important piece of the puzzle when we look at what it is we're capable of doing. <coughs> many, many things we do here, including education, are not fully supported by tuition or the other revenues we can bring in. So philanthropy plays a crucial role in us being able to do the special things we do every day for our patients, for our students, and in our laboratories. Now, you can see that we're in a, in a difficult year expecting continued growth. That's because we have a wonderful development team that works hard on helping us raise money. And I personally am becoming very, very engaged in the fundraising activities of this medical center. I'm devoting somewhere between a quarter and a third of my time to helping us in fundraising. I also want to say that if you look at Vanderbilt University Medical Center now and compare us to the medical centers that we are now competing with, and those aren't the medical centers we were competing with 10 years ago. But now we're competing for students with Stanford and Yale and Harvard. 
if we look at our medical center and those medical centers, the biggest difference isn't our scale. We have as many beds as they do. We're as big as they are. We have as many grants as they do. Our faculty are every bit as good and probably better than theirs. The biggest difference is our endowment. They have bigger endowments than we do, and they're in a better position to retain faculty and support programs. And so this, I list it because I want to track it, I want it to be visible, and I want us to make huge progress in philanthropy at this medical center. <coughs> Finally, I want to talk a little bit about savings. <coughs> you're used to seeing VUMC net results on slides like this. What you're not used to seeing is savings. We need to track our savings. <coughs> it's very important for everybody to know that back in November, when the market was falling and things were getting ugly, one of the reasons we were able to keep it all together is we functioned as one university and our chancellor supported us and made sure we had the cash flow we needed to keep the engine running and the train on the tracks. It's just very important to say that. We are strong because we are one university. And we had to deplete most of our reserves in order to do the things we needed to do to keep everyone here and keep everyone working. And the university really supported us at that difficult time. The other key issue then is, do we think it's suddenly fine now and we're not going to need that savings? Well, of course not. We all have personal savings. We're saving for college. We're saving for retirement. We're saving for the unexpected. We have to do the same thing as a medical center. So $50 million is our savings target for this year. And we'll, help, we'll save that money if we hit this margin target of $72 million. And the whole leadership team believes this is a very achievable goal. Now, if you multiply this by five years, what that says is over about five years, we'd save $250 million. $250 million will pay our expenses to keep operating in a catastrophe for about two months. That's a good thing. I, I'd like it to be five or six months. Over time, we'll get there, but we need to build up our piggy bank as part of our strategy to weather the next storm because we've weathered this storm. So I just wanted to, to put all that up here so everybody kind of understands how these pieces fit together. This is what we're facing. We're looking at a, a Tennessee state economy that's very unstable and isn't clear as to what, how much or whether it will support TennCare. We're looking at unemployment statistics rising in the state of Tennessee that will increase our uninsured care burden maybe by a few percentage points this year, costing tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. In the midst of that uncertainty, it's absolutely crucial that we're doing the things we need to do, not only to make progress in a, as an enterprise, but to establish savings as a medical center. <clears throat> now, how is it that we will step forward in the midst of this chaos? Healthcare finance reform. Who in the heck knows what's going to happen? If anybody knows what's going to happen with healthcare finance, please tell me. Because I don't think anyone knows how that debate's going to turn out. But what is very clear is that the system will not be paying us as much in the hospitals or for professional services. I don't think there's anyone that thinks that healthcare reform and healthcare insurance reform is going to lead to more reimbursement. So, one of the ways we're going to step forward and really succeed and lead during a time like this is by being focused on a new pillar. I told you there was going to be a new pillar. The new pillar is innovation. We have to be explicit about our commitment to innovation. And it has to be something that we hold in front and say, this is something that we can do that other places can't do. The typical health system around in this country, even places like the Mayo Clinic, can't even dream of having the innovation engine that we have here at Vanderbilt. So why we will succeed, not just survive, but succeed and lead in what is an unprecedented environment is we can be focused on innovation and we can actually turn the difficulties that are happening around us into advantages. Let me show you. <coughs> why I think that's possible. 
this is the cost of health care per person in the United States and in the EU. Now, the difference in cost per person is $3,500. So if you figure Vanderbilt cares for about 300,000 unique individuals every year, that's roughly a billion dollars that we spend at Vanderbilt or at places like Vanderbilt that they don't spend in the EU. I'd say that's fine if we could actually show that we're doing better than they are. But it turns out that in the U EU, their mortality statistics are better than ours. They live longer. They get cancer at a lower rate. They get heart disease at a lower rate. Infant mortality is lower. I don't think there's anything they can measure where we outperform them. So clearly, there's room for improvement. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Just breaking it down more specifically, this is that $3,500. And you can see that some of it is you know, higher wages and higher costs of drugs. Some of it is the friction in the insurance system. There isn't a lot we can do about these things, but there is a lot we can do here. And I actually think $1,500 is a gross underestimate. We can apply evidence-based medicine. We can make sure that overuse, misuse, and underuse in healthcare practice goes away. And that will more than pay for health care reform and anything we need to do in this medical center. I, I'm going to show you a few examples of how I think that's possible. But one of the reasons we can pull this off is that we're different. First, there are 130 academic health centers in this country. Less than 25 are fully integrated, meaning the hospitals, the clinics, the practice plan, the physicians, the nurses, the faculty are all one. That means if we want to change something about how we practice, we don't have to have a year-long conversation. We can just do it. That's not true at almost every other academic health center in this country. There's a huge negotiation that goes on over the simplest changes that need to occur. So we have a huge advantage in that we are all one system and we can make collective decisions to do things to change and improve care. The other thing I would tell you is that less than 10 of the top 20 US news schools are fully integrate, our hospitals are fully integrated with a university and only a few are located on the same campus. That's huge for us. If you think about the, the things we're discovering and learning how to do that directly translate into the care we're giving here, that take advantage of the fact that we're part of a university. Chemical biology influencing new drug discovery. Imaging and all the work going on in engineering that's supporting our programs in the imaging sciences that are translating into new care for patients. Just a few of those examples. Things going on in law and humanities that are influencing our ability to manage the ethics around DNA collection and genomics. I could go on and on all day long. The fact that we are part of a university is a key strategic advantage for this medical center. <clears throat> Finally, informatics. We take for granted how wonderful it is to have point of care support in decision making through our, informa through our informatics. When our residents leave here and go to other places in the country, I get letters from them saying, I am miserable because I left Vanderbilt and I don't have the information systems anymore that help me make decisions. We are way out on the bleeding edge in terms of our capabilities with informatics, and those capabilities are going to greatly influence our success. So I want to go back to the story um, about when they were here for five days. And one of the things they noticed was our work with ventilator-acquired pneumonia. This is just one thing that I could pick out to talk about where we have incredible opportunities around um, healthcare practice, applying innovation to provide not only better care, but far less expensive care. This is a standard order set. We have hundreds of them now. Most places don't have any. And in that order set are different things that must be done all the time at exactly the right time for every patient who's on a ventilator. And we have lots of patients in our ICUs and our operating rooms on ventilators. Now, what, what you don't know is that behind these orders are Vanderbilt scientists that work 
a lot of the work that was published that drove these order sets was done right here in this medical center. Now, if that's not linking together the clinical enterprise and the research enterprise, I don't know what is. But this is not sufficient. Having this order set doesn't get it done because the problem is there are at least 50 people at any given time interacting with these patients. So the challenge is having what needs to be done presented to exactly the right person at the right time to make sure the whole system works. And that's what we're calling a systems approach to care. So this is a dashboard indicator that shows every patient and for everything that needs to be done, it shows up green, yellow, and red, meaning everything's done, but this needs to be done right away and somebody's in trouble because it hadn't been done. That's displayed on every computer screen through the whole ICU. Everybody can see it, and everybody knows when something needs to get done that isn't getting done. That's taking evidence-based medicine and using informatics to project it in a way that it's used. Here's what happens when you do that. This is the number of cases of ventilator-acquired pneumonia at Vanderbilt in 2005. This is the number of cases we had in 2009. That's pretty extraordinary. What does it mean to have that kind of reduction in ventilator-acquired pneumonia? It means we, in just 2009, prevented 108 patients from getting pneumonia when they were on the ventilator. Getting pneumonia on the ventilator is one of the two or three major reasons that you don't survive if you're in the ICU. So, we avoided 16 deaths just from this change in one year, and we saved $4 million in hospital costs. This is data we just got back from, the United, from UHC a few weeks ago, and our data on survival for patients who are on a ventilator is number one in the country. So, so what I like to do is I like to take this $4.3 million a year and think about the fact that we are one-tenth of one percent of the hospital beds in this country. If this were being done everywhere, multiply by a thousand, that's $4.3 billion just on ventilator-acquired pneumonia. And then think about the fact that ventilator-acquired pneumonia, I mean, that's one of at least a thousand things that go on here every day where we have this kind of opportunity. We'll multiply by a thousand again. I think we just got into the trillions and paid for health care reform. So, so my message is, is that the issue isn't insurance reform. It's how function as an academic enterprise, as a health care enterprise, and take cost out of the system and dramatically improve quality. That's what we can do better than any other place in the country. And this is our key strategic advantage. <clears throat> Getting this done, systems of care, just like in the, in the inpatient environment, is like conducting an orchestra. If anybody in the orchestra is off key, the whole thing falls apart and everybody notices. Healthcare is sort of like a middle school band playing in your garage. It's not a symphony yet. It's turning into a symphony at Vanderbilt. And just like we're doing this in the inpatient enterprise, we're doing it in the outpatient enterprise. The medical home is the way we're going to do that in the outpatient enterprise. And really conducting the symphony around what patients need to prevent illness is the challenge in outpatient care. And one of the key ways that you prevent disease in outpatients, we know, is by giving them easy access. So we've gone to 100 Oaks, and we've created an environment that's easy for patients to access care. And they come. And we know that has enormous implications in terms of their quality of life as well as the cost of their health care when they do end up in the hospital. Vanderbilt is the only place in, in, the, place in the region where a woman can come from a, for a screening mammogram without an appointment. When I was out at the breast clinic, they told me that they're getting hundreds of these a month. People just dropping in because it's easy. The impact that's having on disease burden is staggering. <clears throat> the other way that we're reaching out to people to actually help them conduct their own symphony is through what we're calling the e-medical home. And this is my health at Vanderbilt. And I don't know if you've logged on or not, um, but you should because 
5,000 people a day are hitting now on this website. And over 75,000 patients are using My Health at Vanderbilt to help manage their care themselves. This is becoming extremely successful as a way to bring what patients need and help them prevent disease into their homes in an easily, in a way that they can access and that's relevant for them. So I'm very excited about these initiatives as ways that we can make a big difference <coughs> in really helping improve the system of care, not only in the out inpatient environment, but in the outpatient environment. Another strategy that I want to talk a little bit about is personalized medicine. Many of you have heard me talk about personalized medicine, and I actually think that personalized medicine is one area, and there are several, where Vanderbilt can step forward and be not just the best in the region, but the best in the country and maybe the best in the world. If I ask somebody in the region, say I'm in Huntsville, what do you know about Vanderbilt University Medical Center? I usually get an answer. Well, I've heard of, it's a great medical center, you have great this, you have great that, they've heard of us. If, if I get on a plane between Boston and New York and I ask the person sitting next to me, what do you know about Vanderbilt University Medical Center? It's pretty dicey. I often, often they've heard of Vanderbilt University. Sometimes I get stuff about Elvis. I hate getting stuff about Elvis. <laughs> we don't have a, f a name yet nationally with the public. We're gaining ground in the academy. Universities know us, they respect us, but the general public outside the region don't know about us yet. They will. Personalized medicine is one area where we can make that happen for two reasons. One is because of what I've told you about, <clears throat> and it's not just our information technology, it's a combination of a number of things. Think about this. If this gentleman is depressed, a third of the time the first antidepressant he gets will not work. His risk for suicide goes up astronomically while that drug that he got that he shouldn't have got is not working. If you look at these two young ladies and if they develop cancer, a third of the time their chemotherapeutic won't work, a third of the time it will work, and a third of the time it will actually make them worse. We have to be the place that solves those problems. So if you look at what we have, we have, one of the, we have the largest DNA bank in the country, and many of you have seen the signs in the clinics. Our genomics programs have become extraordinary. I've told you about our information programs. You can't hire a bioinformatician in this country. They all work at Vanderbilt. <laughs> our proteomics program is the best in the country. No question about it. Our chemical biology program is recognized as one of the top drug discovery enterprises in the whole world, and it is an unbelievable partnership between the university and the medical center where chemists, pharmacologists, and biochemists are all co-located in the same space. There are lots of places that have one or two of those things. There is no place I know of that has all of those incredibly important programs that are essential to making strides in personalized medicine all in one university. That's one point. The other point is what I talked about at the very beginning, our culture. Because for most people outside of healthcare, when you talk to them about personalized medicine, they're not thinking about DNA and targeting drugs to just them. They're thinking about how you treat me when I'm in your office. When I come to Vanderbilt, how do you treat me as a person? That's what personalized medicine means to people. Convince me that Harvard is going to do that better than we are. That's something we own. Our culture will be dominant in our ability to pull off and really become the place that got personalized medicine right. And along with that is all the science and technology that really lets us do something extraordinary that other places can't do. I, you can tell from the way I talk about this, I'm very passionate about it, but I believe this is something where the medical center can step forward. There are other areas 
that we're talking about. And we had a meeting with 100 leaders from throughout the entire university. Uh, all the deans in the university were present at this meeting. We had about 100 people there, and we talked about themes that could be touchstones, that could make Vanderbilt step forward and be recognized and special as best in the world. And these are not strategic plans. These are themes that would drive our strategic planning. Pers excuse me, personalized medicine was one. We talked one, about one called bec becoming human. And the idea there is that as we're trying to conquer disease and we're trying to prevent disease and come up with the latest diagnostic, the big question, the unanswered question, is what does it mean to be human? What is consciousness? What are the things in our social and cultural background that influence our health? What does it really mean to be a human being? No university that I know of, that any of us knew of, is really focused on grappling with that question and what it means for health care. And finally, we call, had something called Beyond Vanderbilt that really says it's not just about us. It's about how we take what we're doing here and move it out across the world. Imagine that the evidence-based protocols that I just showed you aren't just here, but every practice in Tennessee, oh, every practice in the country is using these evidence-based protocols to drive their care. That's growth. That's growth that we can't buy or purchase. That's growth that, grow that, that really means influence. What about if all of our students never really left, and the decision support and the lifelong learning that they depend on for their whole career comes from right here, forever, as long as they're practicing or doing discovery or research or whatever they're doing. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about in Beyond Vanderbilt, how Vanderbilt spreads its influence and grows through spreading its influence across the whole country. We have posted not just the content of the discussion, but the videos of the presentations that were made on the web. And those in this site is now active. And we'd love you to go to the site and listen to the videos of the presentations that were done. They were wonderful. And then give us feedback. And there's a place to give us feedback on the website. And we will send out an email after this address so that you have this website. But I wanted you to know that this was available for viewing. And we really want to know what you think. I'm going to finish with two slides that I think are extraordinary. Because one of the reasons we're here, I think a big reason we're all here, is we all feel at some level, every day we come in to Vanderbilt, something extraordinary can happen. So this was published last week. Um, a new chemical bond. Billy Hudson and his team have discovered a new chemical bond that actually is the reason collagen-4 holds together and is really the substance of the matrix that holds our bodies together, that holds our tissues together. The implications of this for health and disease are profound. It was published in Science. It's being, advertised, it's being talked about all over the country. It's in all the news media. But what I really wanted to say is What's special about this is first, Billy, I know him, and he's been working on this for a long time. And he knew the bond was there, and he just couldn't prove it. Imagine, he knew it, was, he knew it had to be there, and he persevered and persevered and worked and worked and worked and just would not give up. He was relentless. And it's the combination of relentlessness and vision that leads to extraordinary. I also, and I, and I, <laughs> I want to, I want to finish um, with a story that makes people a little bit misty-eyed. Um, this young lady, Caitlin Lassiter, um, some of you know, because she's been here so much that she's interacted with practically the whole healthcare system. This is a young lady that two years ago was in a, um, an amusement park accident where she fell 50 feet and the cables sliced through her lower legs and she lost both of her feet. Six hours later, she was brought to Vanderbilt Medical Center 
and a team of orthopedic surgeons um, were able, after we're operating all night, to con reconnect one of her feet. And this is her walking um, with uh, Doug Weicker, one of her surgeons. She walks normally. <coughs> I, think, I think there are two extraordinary things about this story. One is, and this is sort of the back story, um, two other major academic medical centers turned them down. And the other, the other really, really compelling thing about this story is if you read what the surgeons said, they were, they kept thinking about their own families. And every time the blood flow would shut down, they kept trying because they just had to make it work. This is why it's such an honor to be Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at this institution. And every day we all come in, there are some, there's something extraordinary happening somewhere in this medical center. And I just want to thank you for the honor um, to serve you in this way. And I want your feedback. Uh, we actually have a suggestion box um, that is anonymous. You can send us your ideas and your thoughts about what we're doing. Um, and you don't have to tell us who you are. We want to know. Um, and mostly, I, I'm grateful for your support as we move into a great new year with exciting things happening. I look forward to talking with you and meeting with you in the reception that's, that's going to take place just after this in the, in the reception area. Thank you very much.